Hello and welcome to CX Today. My name is Charlie and today I'm delighted to be joined once again by four excellent customer experience analysts to discuss the latest news from across the space. Yes, today I'm delighted to be joined by Shelley Kramer, Principal Analyst at V3B, uh, Zayas Caravala, uh, Principal Analyst at ZK Research, Liz Miller, VP and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, and last but not least, Michael Forsett, Founder, CEO and Chief Analyst at Arian Research. It's great to have uh, you all uh, join me today and uh, yeah, let's just get right into the news. And I'm going to start off uh, with the launch of a new uh, customer experience solution, and that is the new CX Cloud um, from Genesis and Salesforce. This is very um, big news and it brings a lot of the kind of Genesis contact center, journey um, orchestration and workforce engagement management uh, capabilities to Service Cloud. Yeah, so as I said, it sounds like very big news. I don't know, kind of, Liz, I know you've been following this one. Do you maybe want to kind of kick yeah. us off and give us your first reaction? Well, listen, the, the first thing that struck me when I opened up the uh, news was, you know what, Salesforce Ventures really, they, when they roll the dice, they roll the dice well. Right. And so when they when they start their investments, when you look across that list of like all the AI investments, you look at, you know, like they, they were in, early on in Snowflake, Databricks, you know, like they, they've got the data, they've got now all of the channels. So I, I think that a lot of this partnership gives is really an upside for Salesforce, actually. I know a lot of folks were focused on what this brings to Genesis, and it brings them a lot of nice customer opportunity. It opens up market. It does a lot of nice things. I'm, I'm not underplaying what's happening on the Genesis side of things. But I think on the Salesforce side of things, we've been hearing about Salesforce is going to have a CCAS. Salesforce is going to introduce a CCAS. Salesforce announcing a CCAS. Now CCAS for GPT. Like we've been hearing this cycle for a couple dream forces now and a couple of news cycles. And I think that there's a realization that it's actually really hard <laughs> to build a CCAS. It's not as easy as just saying, let's put some you know, fresh words together. So I think this gives Salesforce a really, really nice addition and expansion into what they can offer that very specific mid-market, fast moving enterprise that just is doing well in that multi-channel engagement and communication specifically for service, but wants to do even better by connecting their marketing sales and service their ecosystem together. This not only brings voice right into the center of that, but it brings a lot of data into data cloud. I think that's the thing I'm looking at, right? Is how does all of this data enhance data cloud? And how does this now all of a sudden turn all of that Einstein, all of the additional kind of GPT of service, what does it do to that? And I think when you're a Genesis and Salesforce customer and you're looking at this joint service, I mean, hello, fire hose of data, get ready to, you know, turn on some new AI models that are really going to have access to some very interesting, very high fidelity signal from customers. I, I, I think, Liz, it also expands the definition of, or the scope of what each company does. One of the issues I've had with the CX industry over the last few years is every event I go to that's CX related from Adobe to Five9 to Genesis to whoever, everyone talks about the customer journey, but nobody really does the end-to-end -end customer journey, right? Like, like one or two very, people I can think of, yeah. Yeah, they do a very little bit of the front end or they do the back end and, you know, Genesis is very sales focused, you know, or, or I mean, Genesis is very service focused, sales, Salesforce is very sales focused. And so when you talk about trying to do AI across customer journey, there's an expression in data sciences, right? That um, good data leads to good insights, but siloed data leads to fragmented insights. And I think that's what we've had in this industry for a long time. And so I'd actually like to see more and more of these partnerships between, you know, Adobe, Salesforce, the contact center vendors, even companies like Content Square, Quantum Metrics, Sprinkler, you know, really anybody that touches CX, I think needs to think about how to create this, you know, that, um, uh, that single data set and help their customers. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I was starting to say earlier that you know, really, the biggest challenge that I think every company is facing is managing and leveraging data, right? And you know, I mean, this isn't this is a solution. This is the data play. This makes perfect sense. And this is you know, this is what um, this is strategic tech partnership has been in place between these two companies for the last decade. So this alliance is not new, right? Yeah. Um, but I think this is incredibly attractive. 
Yeah, I, I, when I looked at it, I, two things sort of jumped out at me. It's it's sort of both directions. In one direction, you get a lot more data back in the into the data cloud that you absolutely need to make all these generative AI tools work. But then on the other end, almost always the number one complaint among customers is the fact that you don't know who they are across all the silos. And, and I think this is one, you know, one play finally that says, look, we could provide this unified data flow across all these different interactions. And that's a really, really powerful thing. Well, unified and bi-directional, you know? And bi-directional, I mean, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's it. That's it. Yep. Yeah, that's a big deal. That. Excellent. Well, I think that's a, yeah, I think that's a really, uh, really great start. And lots of uh, good stuff there. And it's going to be exciting to see where this goes, not only just for kind of Genesis and Salesforce, but um, the kind of implications of such a move uh, for the rest of the industry. Um, and I think now maybe it's good to kind of move on and focus on um, Google um, a little bit. This is an interesting one. I mean, they, they brought out lots of uh, generative AI uh, solutions for the contact center, which seemed uh, really, uh, really advanced actually. And then, but they also brought out this um, art second uh, contact center uh, solution just in the middle um, of the presentation. I think it was called um, contact center AI platform, virtual agents only. Um, and this kind of, this kind of gives a lightweight bridge almost between, I think that's how they phrased it, between kind of your traditional <laughs> contact center infrastructure um, and kind of those Google contact center AI capabilities. It did seem a little bit random. There's not been much press uh, around um, the move. I know Zez, we've talked about kind of Google's positioning in the contact center before. What was your kind of initial um, reaction to that news at Google Next? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't, I could say too little too late, but it's not even really a little, it's a very basic, you know, kind of, there's, there's lots of the, the virtual, you know, uh, platforms out there. And it's, this just sort of continues my thesis that Google really doesn't know what it's doing when it's in the enterprise. They mm -hmm. come out with these nope. half baked solutions that, you know, that address part of a problem. And then they expect companies to build around that. And I think part of this is that it works inside Google and Google has this notion that every enterprise wants to run its operations like Google, but most don't. Right. And so that's why they've been if you look at almost any market they're in Google meet Google cloud, whatever. They're always, you know, the number three of three or whatever. Right. And I, I don't think this really does much for them. It certainly doesn't help them with meet. I don't think this really, I wouldn't expect them to see them in the, you know, the, the, the CCAS MQ next year, but it's just sort of, to me, it's more Google throwing spaghetti at the wall and then hoping it sticks with the small set of customers. Yeah. I mean, sort of read when I looked at it, I, I read like I, it, this could be anybody's announcement because it just sort of had all the things that you need to have. Yeah. Right. Oh, we have knowledge yeah. assist. Now we can summarize your calls. We can generate FAQs like, oh, cool. That's the same really thing everybody else already does. <laughs> yeah. also yeah. does. But Last and year. you know what? The icing on the cake is that we're going to throw in a, a workforce management solution, too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We love we love yeah. all the alphabet. You know, the thing I kept thinking when I was reading it was like, wow, this kind of feels like the Google Plus of CCAS. <laughs> like, like it's that, it's we, we, yeah. we built a social network and then we're yes. totally going to fail. We're going to pretend we didn't do it. Like in, in like in six months, are we going to say, what's CCAS? We didn't. No, we had assistance. It wasn't for, it wasn't a CCAS. It was, it was agent, it was employee assistance. Like they'll reframe it. But I, I think that the reality sometimes though, and I think Zayas, you hit it, right? Is that they don't necessarily know. They assume that everyone wants to operate like them. But the interesting thing about Google customers is that they're oftentimes trying to build a really large Lego set that kind of replicates a big dream of like, this is what I think the Death Star looked like inside. So I went and got all the pieces that said Death Star. But when I started to put it together, it just turned into a giant orange, right? And I, and I think that's kind of where a lot of Google customers find themselves. It's like, I, I got all these great tools. All of the individual pieces are going to be awesome. And they're like, I've got a lot of individual pieces now. And I think it's, I think a lot of times it's the same conversation I hear between Google customers and oftentimes now Twilio customers. I've got a lot of great tools. I've got a lot of great talent and developers. It's the strategy that's not quite getting them there. And I think what Google needs to do next is bring out that thought leadership, bring out 
not everyone wants to operate like Google, but actually what's the playbook that makes Google successful as an operation and then let people build towards it. We don't have that directional piece. We just have a, we're Google. Yeah. And a good comparable, I think, is the, the way AWS has gone to market, right? They started off as sort of a developer first, and then they yeah. they pivoted. You know, I've talked to PQ about this over and over. They pivoted their strategy hard to offer more of a turnkey solution and right. based a lot on kind of advanced AI capabilities. And if you want those things, you'll use AWS, yeah. you know, connect. But I don't think Google or, you know, to your point, Liz, Twilio really ever figured out that there's another way that's going to attract a larger group of customers. Yeah, and I think it, it's hard too if you've gone down that road for so long that you've done tools for developers. This is how you focus. This is where you've been. It's hard to move yourself back and go, wait, that's not really what customers are looking for. Yeah. They're really looking for a solution, not a bunch of pieces. You know, it, it's it's uh, and I sort of felt that way about the the dialogue flow platformy thing. It was like, <laughs> hey, you know, I bet some small companies are just going to want to use bots for customer service. Let's give them a platform so they can build it. Well, and you know, with this, with this, you know, intelligent virtual agent, uh, agent only offering, right? You know, I think one of the selling points is that it allows customers to connect their existing contact center infrastructure to many of the tools within Google's platforms. Do people want that? Right. How many people want Bard mm -hmm. answering all their questions with Adobe Firefly? Like it just, it, I don't, I don't, yeah. Yeah, but I, Zayos, I love that you brought up AWS because like, if I think if we use that as the example, because AWS, when they did make that pivot, the first thing that they put out there was the playbook of how AWS does AWS and what did service, yeah. what does service look like? And Hey, here's the reason why we created this mm -hmm. because at Amazon, we take a billion calls. <laughs> we have a billion <laughs> tickets every yeah. year. Here's how, how we this. handle it. Right. So it's why I think, I don't know if you guys saw the news and gosh, Charlie, I'm adding another news log to the fire, but um, Microsoft this week put out kind of like the Microsoft on Microsoft case study, right? Where you're talking about essentially the largest live test fire of not only AI, but a CCAS is Microsoft. I mean, they've got thousands and thousands, tens and tens and tens on thousands agents handling a billion customers a year on everything from Azure to Xbox. All of a sudden, you now have a working like this is what we did when we turned Copilot on. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy at first. It was a little messy, but here's where we got to. And they have a really honest, open and frank conversation about what is that best practice? What is that guidepost? So when you put all of these tools together, here's where you land. I, I don't see that from Google. Yeah. Definitely see it from AWS. Excellent. Well, I think I think that's just a, generally a very interesting conversation uh, overall. Maybe I was a bit too hyped up by the sounds of it. But, <laughs> <laughs> You're like but, Google. <laughs> but but no, lots of lots of really great um, insights. And I do quickly want to pivot um, as well because I know a few of you were at, um, a couple of weeks ago were at the Five Nine um, CX Summit. And there's some really cool yeah. things coming out of that. Uh, at least yeah. I think they're cool. Um, that one of that was um, obviously the kind of more talk about their uh, acquisition of uh, ACS. There's also a generative, a, a new generative AI solution. I think it was the AI distiller, um, something like that. I know, kind of, Michael, you wanted to uh, touch on this. I don't know. Yeah, if you could kind of give us maybe a takeaway from um, your takeaway from the Five Nine event. Yeah, I mean, I. I I think, you know, we all know this is the year of generative AI. And so, you know, what? a lot of it was, yeah, I, I know Liz, it's How do you news spell that for you, one? but I, I you know, I, yeah, but I, I mean, that was sort of, you know, a lot of it was exactly that. It was like, oh, here's, you know, here are all these new features that are, they're going to be just, you know, the, <clears throat> your sort of entry level thing soon because companies are, are excited about it. And there are a lot of really cool things that you can do, you know, once you build the, the AI into the platform. And and then, you know, if you add into that this acquisition, which, you know, I think is is a very smart play when you're really talking about data. And that's what all of these things live off of, right? It's yeah. data. And so having a, an integration analytics platform that is more advanced, that brings them more capabilities, yeah. that really just enhances and, and opens up a lot of opportunities for their customers, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a great event, actually. The, the audience, extremely engaged. You know, I thought it was uh, Mike Berkland's first, uh, um, you know, event back as CEO. Yeah, he was he was very engaged, uh, but the ACS acquisition does address what I brought up in the Salesforce segment, right? Where fragmented data leads to solid insights, and so 
Uh, Five9 is trying to tackle that and actually address customer journey. And so if you look, ACS integrates with a whole bunch of different platforms, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I, there was, um, uh, of all the things they announced there outside of generative AI, right? Because that everyone's interested <laughs> in that. I'd say the ACS acquisition probably had the most yeah. interest from customers that I talked to. Uh, they were yeah. very curious about how it works, how it links their other systems yeah. together. I think it also helps with on-prem to cloud migrations as well. And as 5.9 goes up market, right, they have to start worrying about that more. It's not, you know, yeah. if you have a 10,000 seat contact center, you're not doing just a hot cutover. There's this long migration. And so their ability to export and import data uh, becomes important. So to me, that was a, we're going to look at ACS, I think, is that acquisition that helped springboard 5.9.2.0. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, you think about that, the partner ecosystem announcements tie right into that too, right? If you're really going to be, if you're going to move up market, you're going to play with the big boys, you got to be able to integrate across all those other partners. I liked it for the migration portion, for sure, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I, I think that's where a lot of customers are still struggling. And there's, and it's what's actually stopping them from pulling the trigger on that cloud move mm -hmm. was, but what if I have, but I still have, but I, it's that, but I still that legacy kind of anchor is holding a lot of folks back. And I think that it's something that's very realistic that can't be overlooked, but I think the migration portion of it, it becomes really important. Yeah. The thing that I have a little bit of worry about is, and Zayas, you touched on this before. I think a lot of folks in what, what gets diminished into the label of CX, i.e. when people call contact center CX, and that's all they're looking at they're going to look at this acquisition and they're going to look at this data layer as something that doesn't exist anywhere else in the organization. This is so amazing. We're going to be the first people who do this. And they're going to emerge from that cocoon and they're going to be greeted by marketing, sales, the rest of service, and this person called the CIO who's going to be like, okay, so now we're going to take this CDP and it's going to marry which other CDP, right? Because if it, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a CDP. Sorry. Mm. So, you know, if you're talking about something that, connects to multiple data sources with persistent connectors and an API first measure, you know, you're right. It's, if, if it, you know, normalizes, standardizes and harmonizes records into a golden record, it's a CDP. So I think that we're getting, you know, the next layer of conversation before we get to that kind of AI 2.0, what we can really unleash with all of this is we're going to have to reconcile the fact that there are a lot of things, there are a lot of toys that each individual function, each individual silo has brought on within the last couple of years. They've called them different things. You can call them a data, a data layer, a swamp, a CDP. I don't care what you call it, but you've all got these now, your CRM, your CDP. There's going to have to be a sanity layer that comes in there because when contact center and when service comes into that full bloom of the rest of Holistic CX, there's going to be a traffic jam. You know, there's going to be a traffic jam right yeah. at that entry into the data lake. And we're going to have to have some serious conversations about it. However, let's get people on the cloud first. And I think that's where the acquisition helps yeah, yeah. that on ramp yeah. really quickly, which I really oh, yeah. like. But it's it's the down the road. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's again, lots of uh, lots of really great stuff. And it will be interesting to kind of see kind of the market reaction as well um, as kind of it's just I mean, it's actually been a long term partner of Five Nine, but as that uh, acquisition continues. Yeah. Uh, One of the big yes, questions I, that came up, though, is, is will 5.9 allow ACS to continue to be multi-vendor? Um, and uh, Big question. Yes, they are that. And Rosenberg was kind of, at least in the short term, he will. And the thing that I left him and, you know, uh, Michael with is you got to do what's best for the customer, right? And yeah. yanking that away from competitive competitors doesn't really help the customer. Right? right, we're moving into a world where inter interops important anyway. So I certainly hope they leave the product multi-vendor. Obviously, you can build more functionality for your own platform, uh, but mm -hmm. a lot of you know, a lot of their competitors actually rely on the product. And it would be, to me, leaving it that way is the right thing to do. Uh, I just think that the the multi-vendor part it, it's it's just so key. I mean, people don't want to be locked in. They don't want to think that I'm getting married to this solution or whatever. So being able to have that flexibility in there is, I think, so important. And I think it's where you can look to Adobe and Workfront as a nice blueprint yes. for how hopefully uh, Five Nine and ACS move forward. Where you know Workfront still has HR customers where you've got HR work, you know, you've still got groups that are working on it in a non Adobe manner and are still our work front customers. So hopefully they use that as a nice blueprint to move forward with that multi-vendor, but also multi-use because not all ACS customers are in the contact center. 
That's the other interesting bit about them, right? Yeah. So they've got a really interesting portfolio of customers. How does Five Nine actually draft off of that and learn from those customers and start listening to those customers? for signal about where they go next for the next innovation and the next kind of leap mm -hmm. forward for five nine. That's what I'm looking to see. Well, Liz, and on that customer front, some of uh, the customers we're talking about are impressive Fortune 100 customers, Verizon, UPS, the IRS, yeah. Sony, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So across different verticals, across yeah. different focuses, um, I think that, I mean, that's part of the value prop here that makes it so attractive. So I think there's an opportunity here, but I think you've hit on something that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think, yes, yeah, a great, great discussion as always across uh, each of those, uh, those topics. And I think maybe a, gr a great place to end uh, today's uh, conversation. So thanks. Um, thanks everyone uh, for joining me today. And thank you everybody uh, too for watching. Uh, bye for now.